Okay. Let's um, let's reconvene. What are traits, dialogue, actions that uh, experiences that make Prince Hamlet uh, character relatable to you, young people, as an audience? Existentialism. Uh, maybe, how about this? Existential questions? Okay. Uh, where do we see those? Okay. Uh, we get that in to be or not to be. Where else do we see his existential crises presented? There are, I mean, we could make this list super long. The second soliloquy, what's the opening line? Oh, that this 2 2 solid flesh is the first one. Is that one the one you were talking about? Would solid melt itself into a dew? And that the everlasting and not fixed is canon of salt is against self slaughter? Yes. Uh, we'll put that one up there as well. Uh, that's good, and we can see that his existential crises, existential questions, are presented in his soliloquies. There you go, that's great. Uh, those are things that we can relate to. I think everyone, correct me if I'm wrong, in this room has thought about why are we here? What does it mean to be alive? How do we define being alive? What does it mean to be dead? Those sorts of things. Good. Okay. Other things that make Prince Hamlet relatable. Kaisa. Uh, I think sort of the Okay. Uh, let's put indecision. Yeah. yeah. Where do we see this? Uh, this is a hard question as well. Where do we see this presented? What examples can you give uh, as proof of that? Uh, I'm not sure, quite sure if this is the best example, but like when he's sort of contemplating on the of Claudius, and then he sees that he's Claudius is praying, and then he starts sort of contemplating what is the right thing to do with him, and then he sort of like undecisive of his actions. Kill Claudius. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. There are a few moments from that, yeah. Um, this could technically be the same thing. Mm -hmm. To be or not to be. Sure. To be or not to be, again. We see his indecision presented in his soliloquies as well. Uh, because he is never able to solve his crises, that results in his inability to act or come to a, a thoughtful conclusion or way in which to progress. Until then. Yeah? Distrust. Distress. Distrust. Distrust. In whom? Uh, Gertrude um, and. Uh, I mean, most of the characters, most of the characters have this stare of Ophelia, not knowing if they're aware of How is distrust relatable? Because I'm assuming most people have in their life not trusting somebody. That's sort of a universal idea, right? You have people who you trust, and you have people who you don't. I trust my parents. I trust my wife. I don't trust everyone on the subway. I think we can all kind of go, yeah, right? Okay, good. Um, what else makes Hamlet relatable? Please. I think uh, the fact that he feels stuck. He is, stuck what, do you mean, what do you mean stuck? Like he's like, uh, isn't he, like he feels like he's stuck in Denmark, like he doesn't want to, like that type of feeling. Stuck in a box? Yeah, stuck in a box. <laughs> and, see, uh, see, we did it, we did the thing yesterday. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's relatable. Like even though we might not feel like stuck in the exact same way we can relate to it as we can be stuck in other ways. Right. Yeah. And that's, I think it's, it's important to note that that's not the same thing as being indecisive. That is his external world uh, keeping him in place, yeah. maybe, rather than himself keeping oh, yeah, yeah. himself from acting. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like it. Yeah. So another word, entrapment? Entrapment would be a good word. He is, <coughs> uh, he is trapped by his... Uh, noble birth, he is trapped by the situation that the ghost has put him in, and his quest for revenge. Uh, help me out, anything else? Mm. I, 
Good enough. Anything else that makes him relatable? How about this? He is a young student. Is anybody in the room a young student? Yeah, I mean, it could be that, that simple, right? Um, I'd also throw in, uh, he's a young student who is in conflict with his parents and guardians, however you want to look at it. Have you ever had a conflict with a parent or guardian? Right, okay, good. Yeah. Frustration with what? Uh, the whole s part of the opening soliloquy where he talks about how the, the funeral meets also furnish the wedding table. Yeah, okay. He is uh, frustrated. Now we're getting into really things that make him a relatable character. What person, what human being hasn't been a young person in conflict with their parents trying to understand the world around them? That That's... Hamlet's relatability in a pardon, pardon the reference nutshell. Yeah? No, 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 sorry. No, go. Um, well, maybe not for everyone in this classroom, but for the person I would see, Hamlet, in the, in the, in the theater, um, Hamlet likes drama. Okay, Hamlet enjoys theater. Yeah. Do you think everybody, I mean, you're all forced to study Hamlet, and I won't apologize for that, but so I, I do sympathize, uh, but, but <laughs> does everyone love drama like he does, okay? So maybe, maybe that's a good transition over to unrelatable traits. But here's the thing, um, I'm not willing, I like that you brought that up and it's actually a really good way to transition because I don't think that that makes him unrelatable to everyone. I think most people who attend a performance of Hamlet want to see it, most. Some people might be dragged there by their great aunt or feel some weird guilty obligation. See it. But most people enjoy theater and want to see, who, who enjoy theater and want to see theater, <coughs> attend theater. And most people who don't, don't. Right? Is there a hand? Yeah, yeah. I can see it. Okay, so I think you're pointing out how I need to change this slide for future generations and put a middle box. What are things that sort of traverse both of these things? And that is his love for theater sort of falls there. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, but what are things that are objectively removed from Hamlet that most people in the audience or the majority of the audience cannot understand, cannot relate to, looks at objectively and has to sympathize rather than empathize with? Good, lots of hands, go. Having to kill. Uh, killing people or having to kill people. Uh, let's, just, let's just call it what it is. Murder. Was that yours? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Insanity, uh, yes. Uh, I've questioned some of you in the room, but but for the most part. Actually, yeah, that might be Insane? We're not sure. And and how we define sanity changes. I mean, our perspective on insanity now is not the same as it would have been madness in Shakespeare's time. But yeah, uh, I consider myself mostly sane. I assume most of you in the room do as well. You went well our moments, but yeah, that's a good one to put up there. Uh, Saskia, you were next. Seeing ghosts. Seeing ghosts. <laughs> What's interesting is um, that's very much for a modern audience. Uh, if you go back to Elizabethan times, ghosts and, and the thought of seeing ghosts and the belief in ghosts was much more common. So the opening scene, uh, it wouldn't have been giggled at as much as we maybe did in this classroom. Most Elizabethans would go, oh, look, it's a real thing. It's the same thing in Macbeth, in the opening scene with the witches. There was much more belief in witchcraft at the time, so those characters were much more believable for that audience. That was a side note. Uh, unique things, go. Being a prince. Being a prince. Uh, let's put royalty up there. Good. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's just put pirate fight. I like it. Right. Incestuous mom and uncle. Okay. Incestuous relatives. <laughs> For the person. Right. Uh, 
Yeah, that's interesting because the definition of incestuous has changed since Shakespeare's time. Uh, but we'll leave that. That's not important for our purposes today. Go. Can that mean parents be murdered? Uh, um, murdered parents. Most people, again, can't relate to that. To be murdered? Uh, yeah, how would we put that? Uh, attempted murder and murdered? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's put attempts on life, I guess. <laughs> the target of the hitman being false. Good. Uh, I think if you look, I think one more? Revenge. Revenge. For for murder. <laughs> Maybe we've all felt the tinge of needing to get somebody back for saying something mean, but revenge for murder, not something we all do. Revenge for murder, good. Um, if you look at the relatable things and the unique things, Shakespeare's done a good job, right? These are very extreme things if you look, look at what they are, right? Seeing ghosts, being insane, being royalty, fighting pirates, uh, having incest in your family. These are all, they make us go, whoa, what nothing to do with that, right? But um, all of these things over here, we kind of go, I get it, I can relate to that. So um, a lot of people say that Hamlet is a very relatable character. That's why people like him. But he's not. These, these things are very extreme, right? But we as, as an audience accept the balance that's created by Shakespeare as the play progresses. And so the, what do we call it when you develop a character? You do what? It's that word I gave you at the beginning. Start with an A. You articulate a character. So Shakespeare's articulation of Prince Hamlet as the play progresses, using these two things, draws us in, makes him interesting, and gives us that balance between subjectivity and objectivity. It makes him a good character. Was there a between external articulation and internal articulation? Save that, we're going to come to it a little bit later. Thank you. But I, I appreciate you asking the question. And, and we've kind of done both here a little bit, but that's that's the next thing we're going to do. Okay? Good. Yes? Well, like, what, what does it mean to have balance between the two? Because they're not like exactly the same. How do you, like... It kind of goes back to, to looking at subjectivity and objectivity on a spectrum, like we did earlier. If you're too far in one direction, you don't want to relate to the character. So in, in so doing this exercise, we can see that balance that created and where uh, Hamlet sort of falls on the spectrum. I personally, I don't find Hamlet to be the most relatable character because of the extremity of the things that create an objective relationship with him. But I'm still interested in finding out who he is, what he's all about, and what his fate will be, as I think most members of an audience would be. And it's the, the big thematic questions that create that. Yeah? If Hamlet were just sort of an angsty, whiny teenager, which some people would consider him to be, uh, I wouldn't want to watch him, right? If you guys read um, uh, Holden Caulfield, uh, Catcher on the Rye. Has anybody read Catcher on the Rye? No. Okay. G do you relate to Holden Caulfield? Did you go, I see myself so much in him. No? Cat? No. Neither did I. I made the mistake of reading that book when I was in college, and I just thought he was very whiny the whole time. I know people love that book and, and, and whatever, but, but um, that's a really good example. He's a teenager. He leaves school. He goes into New York City. He hires a prostitute. All of these things. He's just, he doesn't know what to do with his life. He just goes, and, and he's sort of the opposite of Hamlet. Um, he fell too far onto the unique side of the spectrum for me as a reader in the novel, and so I didn't care. I didn't want to find out what happened to him. I didn't want to keep, I, I hated that. I had to read it for school, so I had to finish it. But by the end, I went, I'm never reading this again, and I haven't since. Poor Dave's class has to read it, though. Um, so, so for me, the character of Holden Caulfield falls too far on this end of the spectrum, and. Uh, and I find him unrelatable and do not care. He is not articulated in a way that makes me want to know more and to, to capture my attention. Does that help? Cool. Any other questions about character articula external character articulation? Oot. This is a really good exercise 
to do when you're studying for your paper twos. Do this not only with Prince Hamlet, but do this with Claudius. Uh, do this with Laertes. Do this with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. From Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Do this with all of the characters from Glass Menagerie, because they're all very different and unique in their own ways. Uh, and I think it will give you some insights, aside from the conception of the character, into the articulation and building of the character. Cool? And these are done best with complex characters. I think so. I, I mean, your chart will be larger with complex characters. You don't need to do this with, like, Bernardo, mm. the guard, uh, from Hamlet. I, I, I mean, guard. <laughs> I'm not a guard. I never guarded anything. Um, saw, saw a ghost, right? The, the, the list goes on. But uh, don't worry about simple characters. But maybe complex ones, this is a good Or, or titular characters, at the very least. This is a good one to do again. Okay? Any other questions?